Hello, welcome to at and Threat Track for February 12th, 2013. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. Welcome. Uh, joining the program today, we have John Markley and Jim Clausing, and of course, I'm John Hogaboom. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today, and we're going to kick it off uh, with a story that you have for us today, John, uh, about Turk Trust, and maybe they signed some certificates they shouldn't have. Well, yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting story. It, it actually started a couple years ago, and Turk Trust is one of those certificate authorities um, that probably not a whole lot of people know, but they're built into most of the devices. And, and a certificate authority is a third party that you trust, so that when you do a handshake like to an SSL, like to a banking or whatever site, you will, you know, you need to be able to trust somebody to tell you that, that those credentials get passed. And you use a certificate like your SSL certificate to make that happen which is signed by this trusted entity that they call Certificate Authority. Turk Trust is a, is a major player. I mean, uh, probably about the 50 that are considered major, they're one in the top group, and they are built in most of the devices across the, the enterprise and in the, in the, in the, in the world, really, because you can find them on, like, on Android phones and iPhones and whatever. Well, back in 2011 in August, they, they actually made a little bit of a mistake, and their mistake, and yeah, this is all public knowledge, they, they, they actually put their intermediate signing certificate onto their production server. And so what that meant is that when somebody was, was given that certificate, then they could sign it as Turk Trust. So, not, so let's say they gave it to you know, Company X, then Company X is actually signing things as, as Turk Trust, which means that everybody trusts them. And... Uh, you know, this, this uh, issue was identified pretty rapidly, and Turk Trust has been very open about the problem. Um, they've issued only two certificates that they're aware of that were uh, a challenge. One went to, um, really, we don't know. <laughs> they never really released that one. They pulled it back, and then the, the, which, and it never got used. The other one is the one where they kind of caught this issue. Is it went to a, uh, the, a group called EGO, which is the Turkish Transit Authority. And EGO actually, through kind of a series of, I don't know, interesting events. It's just kind of a technological issue. Issued a certificate for Google.com. I mean, for all of Google.com. And so if, from a security perspective, that meant if a hacker or somebody else got a hold of the certificate, they could pretend to be Google, and you would never know it. You would actually see an SSL session, the little key and everything else looking all clean and nice, and uh, you wouldn't really realize it. So Turk Trust has come out really positive, uh, announced this, done a very good job of uh, indicating that, that this problem exists. Um, and so really what it meant to us as a consumer is that we need to make sure we're up on current releases. And Microsoft actually has uh, uh, what they call CRL, Certificate Revocation, and cert this, the, the list that contains the Turk Trust was actually pulled back. So these bad certificates was, re re was revoked. Um, Apple also did the same thing in their release that came out in February of this year. So this has kind of gotten out of the way. Um, some of the other devices like Android and others are still coming out with the updates to this. But what it kind of tells us is, is first off, is that, you know, you still, even with this key and this trust relationship, you've got to be careful. You've got to know what you're doing. Don't give away personal information that you really don't want out there. Um, you do have to issue some kind of a trust. I mean, we can't survive anymore without it. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing, of course, is, is keep your products up to date. You know, these, these CRLs, these patches, whatever, without them, we, you know, you, you never know what you're going to get. So, so when you do see these releases, you know, we, we always just say, get them out there, get them installed, and, and just do it. So, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's slowly getting fixed. I mean, there's, like I said, there's still a few products out there that aren't done, but if, if somebody hasn't updated their certificates, e even though that this risk has seemed to be small, there's only this one certificate that's, that's seems malicious or not malicious, potentially malicious, um, it still is a good idea just to keep everything up to date. Right. And, you know, we've talked about certificates in the past and uh, the protections you need to safeguard them, uh, especially if they're your own that you've had signed for, you know, your legitimate website or even code signing certificates, which are kind of tangentially related. Um, but in this case, it sounds like Turk Trust had a little bit of an issue where they had an intermediate signing certificate that allowed people to sign things as though they were them. And again, that's on their onus that so they need to, you know, make sure that um, they, uh, you know, keep tight reins on who's able to actually do that. And uh, it looks like there was a little bit of a, a mix-up there. 
and um, fortunately it was recognized and uh, uh, taken care of before it became, you know, an out-of-control problem. But like you said... Yeah, minimal exposure. Minimal exposure. I mean, they're really not... They don't issue a whole lot of certificates, so you probably don't see, at least in, in most of the world, you don't see a lot of certificates with Turk Trust signature, you know, signed, but they're still going to be out there. Right. Yeah, it's... We've talked about it before, and, you know, the, the idea of the certificate revocation lists is a good one that, you know, if they if the browsers check them as they're supposed to, you know, then then you ought to be able to just update the revocation list, you know, and then take your time getting the the actual certificates pulled out of the browsers, but there are ways around that too, so the updates are really important. Right. That's cool. And I think we've talked in the past about even looking at who you actually trust in your browser. There is a way to go into your browser, see who your trusted signers are. Are these ones that, and for the most part you would, um, but there might be situations where you're like, well, I don't really know who this company is that's, you know, authorized to sign certificates here, uh, depending on your own particular situation. It's not saying that that's the case here, but it's good to review what's in there and make sure it's up to date, like you said. Um, so. Uh, so thanks for bringing that story to us. That was a good one, um, a good reminder that, you know, SSL, and that is the gatekeeper of encryption and security um, on your websites and in your communication. You want to make sure that that, um, that stuff is uh, kept safe and secure. So one of the other stories we had um, is about Microsoft, in partnership with Symantec, uh, has done another takedown, uh, botnet takedown operation uh, for the Damatol botnet. Uh, this is a uh, click fraud. I don't think we've ever really talked about it on the show before, um, but it's a click fraud type botnet. Um, it does search hijacking, so when you go to search for something, they give you um, forged results uh, that suit their own uh, uh, their own needs. So what it's going to bring back is search results for websites that they want you to click on so that they get advertising revenue. It also does other kinds of click fraud type behaviors behind the scenes to click on advertisements as though a human is doing it so that they gain ad revenue. In any event, um, this was uh, Microsoft Operation B58, I think it was, uh, is what their code uh, name for it is. And they've done a lot of botnet takedown operations over the past few years. I think this might be number six. Uh, I know Zeus was another big one. Uh, the Nightall botnet uh, was another one. Uh, the Zeus one was a real big one, in my opinion, because that, that was really running rampant. There were a lot of offshoot uh, versions of it out there, um, and they did a pretty good job taking that one down, although it has resurged since then. You know, uh, uh, new actors have started up other Zeus botnets with new domains that Microsoft has not taken down or did not take down in that operation. So um, I don't know if anybody else had any thoughts about that. I think this is a good thing. Um, I encourage Microsoft to do it. It affects Microsoft products, so I think that's why they get involved with it, because most of these involve... Windows machines getting compromised. Um, and from what I heard, the Bamatol botnet was about 8 million bots strong, something like that. So that's a pretty hefty number. Um, and that's a, uh, it's good to have, you know, 8 million machines uh, cut off from the command and control. Now I guess the, the challenge is, I don't know where we're at with this in terms of cleaning up those machines, making sure that, you know, uh, they get cleaned up somehow. And I would imagine Microsoft's Windows Defender at some point would, uh, it, I'm sure it does now, but it's probably going to get better at cleaning up all the orphaned bots at this point. Um, any any thoughts on that from anybody? No, I, I great thing that that they're taking these down because getting the bad actors out of there whenever we can is always a good thing. Right. Yeah, and, and it, it's interesting. I mean, I still even today. I mean, you know, as a learned. I guess, you know, experienced professional in this is, you know, you get all these emails that say, you know, click here, you know, and you think, I got one today, and, and I thought, well, it looks legitimate, and I almost clicked on it, and I thought, wait, 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 that's, that's not real, and so they're getting better at it, so I, I, it's it's really good for Microsoft to have addressed this, um, but, you know, the problem is not going to get solved just by Microsoft taking stuff down. We got to, you know, we got we to gotta be smart, too. Right. So yeah, it's it's a it's a, a group effort to get these things taken down. Uh, the first line of defense is the human being, 
you know, be smart about your browsing habits, your email reading habits, like John was just saying. Uh, try to protect yourself by just being a safe Internet user, uh, and hopefully you won't get infected to begin with. Uh, okay, so next story. Uh, we have lots of updates. Uh, today is Microsoft Tuesday. Uh, I know they have a lot of updates, and there's some other software uh, products that have uh, some recent updates as well. Uh, you have some information about that, Jim? Yes. Um, today was, as you said, is Microsoft Patch Tuesday, and um, they released a, a, quite a few uh, bulletins this month. There were 12, 12 bulletins, five of which they marked as critical. They affected all kinds of things from Internet Explorer to uh, the media um, Microsoft Exchange, .NET, um, uh, SharePoint. Uh, there is, they affected a whole lot of different components, and um, been been busily reading through all of these bulletins, and frankly, haven't made it through all of them yet because there were so many of them. <clears throat> Uh, but the key is there are a, a couple of them that are really critical, uh, potentially remote code execution. Um, Sometimes, you know, some of them are exploitable via drive-by if you've got the uh, appropriately crafted web page. Um, so there are, there are a lot of them here. Uh, apply them, as always, you know, as soon as possible. Um, as soon as you can get them tested. I, I haven't seen any that, that really jump out at me that I was, I don't believe there are um, any exploits in the wild for, for too many of these yet. Um, that was one of the things I was looking for and I, I didn't see it. I don't recall that there were any that were being used that we were anxiously waiting for right off either. So. Um, but there are a lot of them, uh, so make sure that you get them applied. Um, some of the, for example, the IE one applies to all versions from 6 through 10. Hmm. Aren't we supposed to be off the 6 by now? Isn't that supposed to yeah, be gone? Are, we're supposed to be, but uh, it still seems to hang around. And, you know, that was things that was targeted in one of the attacks last last month so you know one of the things like you said that I look for notably on these and you know uh, when we're recording right now these have just come out so uh, you know our uh, our ability to actually know the full impact of them is probably not as precise as we want to be but one of the things I do look at when they come out on Microsoft Tuesday is which ones are remote code execution? Because those worry me because they're what I would call wormable uh, sometimes. You know, just the user doesn't even have to be at the machine for it to get compromised. As long as it's connected to the Internet and that port is reachable, it's potentially uh, compromisable. And um, so th those are ones that, you know, if, if you review these today and you see that there are some remote code execution ones, try to assess what ports um, those would be access, you know, accessed via and filter or block those if you can. If you can't apply the patch right away for whatever reason, you know, those are things where you want to assess, what is that port? Uh, do I need it open and exposed to the Internet? Um, and if not, let me just block it so that nobody can, you know, leverage this vulnerability until I can get it patched. So. Right. And some of these that, that, they, that Microsoft claims remote code execution doesn't necessarily mean um, exploitable about user intervention, but and I have not seen any of them in this bundle yet that have, and will obviously, uh, as as you said, we they just came out in the last two hours or so. So continue to look at them, and if anything it really important comes up, we'll uh, we'll bring it up again on next week's show. Right. But yeah, I, that, those are exactly the th kinds of things I look for. What you know, what can be remotely what is remote code execution? What can potentially propagate without user intervention? 
those are the real biggies that I worry. Right. And I don't I don't see any of the latter at, at this point. Okay. And there's a couple other uh, software products with some problems that had some patches recently. Yeah, it's it's been a busy uh, busy uh, few days a week here for uh, updates. Um, Adobe has released a one out of cycle uh, critical update for um, Flash Player. They released that on Friday, I believe, um, Thursday or Friday. And uh, I don't know a whole lot of details on it. The the explanation was kind of sparse, but it was um, it was it potentially could allow attackers to take you know remote control of your uh, of your uh, device if you happen to browse to and see you know a, a website that had a malicious uh, SWF flash uh, object on it. And apparently exploits were in the wild, which is why they they pushed the update early. So um, be on the lookout for that if you haven't seen it. You know, most Windows devices, if you're running the current version, um, may have to update that by hand. I don't. I'm not sure if the Adobe update or updates Flash or not. I know it updates uh, Reader. It's something we'll have to double check before next time. Um, if the if their automatic update or updates flash, then hopefully you'll get it, you'll see it without having to go look for it. If not, you need to go look for it and apply it. Um, then there there were a couple of other things we talked about. Uh, Open SSL last on last week's show, um, and uh, the folks, the Open SSL folks, have pushed another update since then. Uh, apparently, one of the we concentrated on the Lucky 13 vulnerability, but actually there had been several of them that had been discovered that were being that were patched in or supposedly patched in last week's update, and uh, they pushed another update yesterday um, because they had apparently made an error in uh, fixing one of the. Uh, it was a denial of service vulnerability in AES um, NI platforms. I don't remember what the NI is, but AES is advanced encryption. Uh, anyway, so there's another update. It went from 1.0.1D to 1.0.1E. So if you are using OpenSSL, you probably want to apply that patch too. Um, the Java updates, you know, we got the whole bunch of Java updates that were pushed early, um, rest 50 vulnerabilities. Um, it turns out Oracle has announced that they didn't get all of the updates in that they were originally planning on, so they are still planning on doing some updates on the 19th, which was their regular scheduled time to do that. So we'll be seeing those uh, coming up. And then the last thing that I wanted to talk about was um, updates to PostgreSQL. We we often talk about you know we see scanning for MySQL and Microsoft SQL Server. Um, PostgreSQL is another uh, open source database product that is out there that a lot of people like. I've used it myself in the past. It's available for all of the Linux and BSD distributions. Um, Mac OS 10, Solaris, Windows, it's available for all of them. And they just uh, pushed out an update in the last uh, couple of days, I think on Friday, um, for 8.3 and 9.2. Those are the two most current versions. Um, and they, there is a security vulnerability in among the other patches that um, allowed a potential denial of service, an authenticated user um, calling a, a function with invalid arguments uh, would could potentially crash the database. So 
If you run PostgreSQL, you might want to apply this one uh, as soon as possible. This, th these updates are the last ones for 8.3. 9.2 is the is the most current version. It's the version that most people are moving to. But again, the, like a lot of things, this is the kind of software that doesn't necessarily get upgraded until you need to, as long as it's the applications that you're using it for are running properly, people tend to be slow to update it. So make sure you apply these patches. But yeah, really busy patch day. I, I think there are some uh, other patches that are due out today that I haven't seen yet. So we'll probably talk about more next week. Okay, great. And, you know, Postgres, like you said, uh, not as big of a following as MySQL. And uh, you did say it had to be an authenticated user, right? I believe I believe that the the security issue was it required an authenticated connection. Um, so it, that is one thing. It does require credentials in the database. But um, yeah. Well, one thing we might want to keep an eye out for for next week is see if we see any increased scanning on. I think Postgres is 5432 TCP, but I could be wrong. I, so, I think I'll double check that though. Yeah. Uh, but scan for that, and or we'll see if we see any increased scanning on that, looking for, you know, now that this vulnerability has been, you know, announced. But if it is something where you need to be authenticated, it might be less likely for, uh, you know, uh, attackers to scan for it because it won't be as easily exploitable. Um, not to say that we don't see MySQL scan for all the time, too, and we'll, we'll shift over that now. Uh, speaking of which, uh, we'll take a look at um, what kind of uh, activity we've been seeing um, uh, from the AT&T uh, Internet security perspective here. And um, uh, one of the first ones we have here is uh, we have some continued scanning. I think Brian might have covered this last week, uh, the Asterix VoIP uh, server on 5038 TCP. And uh, one of the other interesting side notes, I took a little closer look at this. It has decreased. We're not seeing quite as much as we were last week. Um, there was definitely a, a kind of a, a accelerated amount of this last week, uh, but we're still seeing a few spikes here and there. And um, we are seeing in conjunction, I've also tagged in here port 4445 TCP. We're seeing these same actors scanning, uh, looking for asterisk. They're also uh, trying to hit this 4445 TCP, which is the flash operator panel on uh, asterisk or tricks box as well. Uh, so there might be some some other uh, uh, avenue of exploit that they're they're aware of there. In addition, we also see them scanning for 5060 UDP, which is SIP. Does that make sense? Um, and 3306 TCP, which is MySQL, which we were just kind of talking about. Um, that's the backend database frequently used with asterisk. So they might be scanning for all of those, just looking for any way to get into the machine via the various software products that get installed on there. Um, so keep an eye out for that. If you do have an asterisk, um, you'd want to make sure that, uh, you know, filter whatever access you can to that. Uh, it's only people who need to be able to access it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I always encourage logging activity that goes on uh, at your Internet-facing devices. Uh, another one that we're also seeing uh, some more robust scanning activity on is 5631 TCP, which is PC Anywhere. Uh, notably, it's mostly coming from a single source address in China. Uh, interesting, you know, I don't really think of PC Anywhere as a mainstream product that a lot of people use, so I guess it's used more often than I realize maybe in my uh, universe that I work in. Uh, but we also see uh, the same sources involved in this scanning activity looking for 5900 TCP, which is VNC. So, um, you know, I was kind of looking at, well, these guys who are doing this scanning for a particular port, what else are they scanning on? And you can kind of see that they're looking for remote control access uh, to devices, and that's the kind of uh, things that they're targeting in, in their scanning activity. Um, so again, if you, uh, if you have any of these uh, software products exposed internet facing, uh, you'd want to be uh, make sure, again, that it's filtered. Uh, it's only the people that should be able to access it and, uh, and or put whatever other means of security on top of that if you can. VNC is a big one that we see scanning all the time. We'll probably pop up in the in the chart later on here. This was another one, a nice rainbow chart. These are always uh, fun to look at. But this is uh, increased scanning on what I'm going to call alternate HTTP ports. And um, 
This is activity for a single source address. And it's kind of interesting, this activity, when you actually look at it. So this is a single guy in China who is engaged in scanning activity. And I happen to notice that he is uh, scanning uh, a bunch of ports here. And I have them enumerated at the bottom here. So the dark green is port 88 TCP. Uh, that's the first one. Then there's a blank gap in there, and I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, the lighter aqua blue is 8081, and then we have 8086, and then 8088, and then 8089, and finally 8090, which you just started this uh, today, which is the blue one here. The thing I thought was interesting when you look at this is, first of all, he's doing something interesting in that he's, well, maybe interesting and uninteresting. He's scanning the IT4 address space sequentially. So we're starting at like 1.1.1.1 and scanning all the way through the entire Internet address space up to 255, 255, 255. Well, not really, but, you know, you catch my drift because uh, that's the broadcast address. But in any event, he scans the entire IP port Internet address space, well, one right after the other. And uh, one of the things I thought was interesting about this is if you look at these, he, uh, it, a, a pattern, a clear pattern emerges in here where you see, you know, a tall spike around 13 million flows per hour, and then another one uh, around 6 million flows an hour, and another at 6 million, and then two smaller ones, and then kind of a, a little hill and another hill. And if you go here again, you see the same kind of thing, up around the 15 million, uh, around 6 million, another one, two close together, a kind of a hill, a kind of a hill. And you can see this pattern repeats over and over again. So one of the interesting things about this is since he's scanning the IP4 address space sequentially, uh, what's really happening here is these peaks uh, and valleys, the peaks are where we actually, AT&T, have address space provisions. So, you know, he's scanning zero, and when he hits the 12 address block, which is a big part of our AT&T address space, that's the first big spike. And then the next spike, a little bit smaller at 6, is 32.00-8 he wanders into. And then you can see he moves into the – we have a bunch of assorted little address blocks and some of these other ones between 63 to 67, 96 to 100, et cetera, et cetera. You see he kind of like is literally walking through it sequentially. You can see that pattern emerge. And uh, I've talked about this before. I made a little diagram. This is that lighthouse effect that I've talked about before. When, when people scan, um, they're scanning if the attacker is in a lighthouse and he had a beam of light that he was shining across the entire Internet – when he walks across, you know, the first part of our address space, that light actually funnels into our network, and we see that scanning activity. But when he wanders away from us into some of these dark areas, that's not our address space. And then again into the 32 address block, and then into some dark space that we don't have visibility into. So I just thought that was an interesting effect that you could actually see uh, how predictable his behavior is. And as soon as he finished one, he started another, and then finished one and started another. Um, and whatnot. And it takes them about two and a half days or so to scan the entire Internet address space one by one. So um, why he's doing this uh, is another question. Uh, it's probably he's looking for proxies or other alternate uh, whatever services are running there. He's definitely looking for HTTP-based services. Uh, could be administrative access to various products. Could be proxies. Uh, since it is China, they do scan for proxies quite a bit to to find ways that they can access websites that might be restricted from within their country. Um, can't tell for sure, uh, but he's definitely trying to figure out uh, what is available on all these various ports. What happened in that uh, space where he took a couple of days off? Oh, yes. I forgot to mention that. So this oh. gap, he didn't actually take time off. He was actually scanning um, port 80. And uh, so I left that out because he would have faded into the background noise of the, the Internet. There's too much scanning on port 80. I couldn't really see him specifically. Uh, but he was, for these other ports, he was the kind of lone actor engaged in that. So I could tell that he accounted for, you know, almost all of, you know, all of this activity, um, whereas the port 80 he wouldn't have. It would have just been too much noise. Uh, so that, that was what that gap is in there. You can tell it's about the same amount of space in between as well. 
so looking at the top most probe ports, these are the ports that are probed most often by count, by volume, not who's doing it. We're going to look at that in a second. This is just by volume of how many scan probes occur. And uh, no big changes here. Uh, you know, we see all the zero access ports here, 1464, 16471, uh, 16465. Those are all peer-to-peer -peer communications for zero access. Maybe Microsoft will try to take that one down, uh, which we talked about with the BAMA call. That's probably more difficult for them to do. It is a peer-to-peer -peer based botnet, um, not very easy to take down. Uh, which is one of the advantages of having a peer-to-peer -peer based botnet, but the side effect is it's very noisy. We can see this activity um, of all these bots engaged in that. 445 TCP, um, you know, uh, service message block, uh, that's a, you know, a lot of Conficker and other types of botnets have leveraged that exploit over the years, uh, or at least past year and a half. Uh, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, 1433, and then you have your remote access stuff, uh, Telnet, port 22, SSH, we've got RDP, port 3389, and then 3306, MySQL. Um, that one comes and goes. It's usually towards the bottom. Sometimes it doesn't show up in the top 10, but it does uh, crop up from time to time. And we've seen some increased scanning on that more recently. Now, when we look at the most sources probing, so who's doing, like, um, by terms of the number of unique source IPs doing scanning activity and what they scan on, uh, the picture is very similar. Uh, again, we see lots of zero access with the 16 port, 16,000 port ones here. Um, we see again, this is always pretty much the top guy here, 445 TCP, and uh, people searching for Telnet on 23 TCP. Uh, some of this uh, ICMP, this is probably just background noise of pings and, and whatnot. Uh, the one that I did want to point out, and I don't think we've seen this before, but for whatever reason, 2816 ICMP, excuse me, uh, took the next to last spot, it looks like. And um, I actually had to look this up because uh, our system usually will tag it properly. So 8, zero, eight colon 0 is an echo request, I think, and I forget 3.3 three three is a reply port not available or something like that. 2816, when you actually convert it, is 11 colon zero, which is time exceeded, time to live, expired in transit, which is, uh, uh, you know, something that I'm kind of surprised we don't see more of, but for whatever reason, we had a lot of those um, uh, over the past couple of days. Uh, so maybe somebody was trying to scan a large or ping a large amount of address space that uh, is non-routable, and... Uh, uh, they got uh, expired messages back uh, as a result of that. So, so that's all uh, I have for today. Um, anybody else have any comments before we wrap it up? No, we, just that uh, the time exceeded in transit, you sometimes get that if, if there is a routing loop, if somebody has misconfigured something. Um, Okay. I, just, I, I, just, I just wonder if there wasn't a, one of the major nodes had some kind of problem or something and we were uh, routing around it. I'd have to think back into the news lately if I remember hearing anything about that, but um, maybe we could follow up on that for next week uh, to see if there's any correlation with those events. So that's a good point. Uh, all right. Uh, so that's our show for today. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, uh, you can email us at threattrack at list.att.com. Mm -hmm. you, you can also follow us on Twitter at, uh, at threattrack. And the threattrack video is also available at att.com slash threattrack and on YouTube. And you can subscribe to our audio-only feed on iTunes, which is good if you're driving in the car. You can listen to it on your, uh, your iPod or your iPhone. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we'll be back next week with a new episode. Until then, keep your network safe.